Hey everybody, in this video we are going to start talking about genetic mutations. And I think we've talked about these in various contexts uh, throughout the semester. Today we are going to look at them in a slightly different way. We are going to cover four terms that are very similar and it's easy to confuse these. So uh, directed, random, <clears throat> induced, and spontaneous. So I find these terms confusing, but, but we use them in slightly different ways. So for example, random and spontaneous, those seem very similar to me. So do directed and induced. Uh, so it can get confusing when uh, we discuss these terms because we use them to talk about different concepts. So we use these two when we are discussing why, so any given gene, so let's say why gene A mutates instead of gene B. So we're going to use these terms to talk about this concept here. And over here, well, we're going to use induced and spontaneous to talk about how, say, mutations occur in general. So uh, let's take UV light. UV light can cause mutations. Do these cause induced? Do these induced mutations or do mutations occur spontaneously? when they're caused by UV light, which of these terms is more appropriate? Or a, say, let's say polymerase error. If a mutation occurs by a polymerase error, is that an induced mutation or a spontaneous mutation? So we have two ways we can classify mutations uh, based on how they occur. We can classify them as induced or spontaneous. So we'll use those terms for this concept over here, these two terms for this concept over here. Specifically in this video, we are going to talk about uh, are mutations directed or spontaneous? We'll cover the other terms in uh, an upcoming video. So directed or spontaneous. Now let's take directed first. So what does directed mean? If, if a mutation is directed, what do we mean by that? So I think the easiest way to explain this is to consider a bacterium. It doesn't have to be a bacterium. We could use animals or plants, but it's easiest to see, I think, with the bacterium. So let's say this is E. coli, and it is a cell that is susceptible to uh, bacterial infection. Let's say T1 bacteriophage. And that's just a virus. Bacteriophage is, is just a fancy term for a virus that infects bacteria. So we're using a, a strain, or this is a cell of a strain of E. coli that is susceptible to infection with a bacteriophage called T1. Now let's say this E. coli cell is swimming around wherever it is out in the environment, and it comes into contact with that bacteriophage. And so here's maybe what this bacteriophage looks like, and it's probably got its genome packed in there. Now, if a mutation occurs somewhere in the E. coli genome, in a gene that makes the cell resistant to the bacteriophage as a result of coming into contact with the bacteriophage, that would be an induced mutation. So let's say the mutation occurs the bacteria senses the virus is present. Let's say the infection starts and the, the, the fact that it started triggered a mutation in a gene. E. coli mutation causes resistance. Okay. So then we have the E. coli surviving infection 
now this E. coli cell is resistant to uh, the virus. So a directed mutation occurs as a result of coming into contact with something in the environment. So, and how could that happen? Well, one possibility is there could be a protein complex that is in charge of, you know, sensing E. coli is, is in the environment and then targeting certain genes inside E. coli and mutating those to allow E. coli to become resistant. And if there's no virus present, so no mutation would occur. So that's what, what directed means uh, in, in this, this topic we're discussing. So are mutations random or are they directed? So directed is the cell comes into contact with something in the environment that is inhibitory to its survival in the environment and something, some protein complex in E. coli mutates the correct genes that to give that E. coli a chance of surviving in that environment. So that's the mutations it are directed hypothesis. Now, the other possibility, the contrasting possibility, is that mutations are random. So if they're not directed, then they should be random. So that's the competing hypothesis. So what does that mean? So essentially what that means is that this is our E. coli cell that is normally susceptible to that bacteriophage. And let's say it divides and makes two cells, two daughter cells that are both susceptible to the virus, but let's say a mutation happens at random in this one right here. So random mutation in gene causes virus resistance. Okay, and here we just have wild type up here, no mutation. Well, if both of these come into contact with the virus, only this one down here will survive the infection. So I can draw little viral, viral particles in here because it was infected and now cell lysed and viruses are coming out and the cell is dead. And down here, well, this one survives. So, and it's not infected. So here the mutations occurred randomly and it was only, so, so this one survived just because it happened to have a mutation in the right gene that allowed it to survive. It wasn't the fact that it had encountered, it did not encounter this virus in its environment. It just somehow by some random mechanism happened to, to suffer a mutation in a gene that happened to allow it to survive the infection. So remember in the directed hypothesis, the organism encountered the agent first, in this case the virus, and then the mutation developed in the right spot, in the right gene that caused resistance. In this one, the, in the mutations are random hypothesis the mutations are occurring randomly before exposure to the agent in only those cells that you know happen to have the, the mutation in the right spot are able to survive the infection. So that was an important question in the, I guess, first part, maybe, I guess, uh, uh, the middle of the last century. So. The scientists who are credited with, I guess, the first key experiment that tested the directed versus random hypothesis are uh, Esther and Joshua 
Letterberg. I'm assuming this is a husband and wife team. I guess it could be brother and sister. I'm not really sure. So what they came up with was this neat technique called replica plating. Well, they used it. I'm pretty sure they came up with it too. And I think one of the reasons why we like to cover this in genetics is because it's an important technique in genetics. And uh, the, I guess its first important use is an important thing to cover in a course like this. So what is replica plating? So essentially, you use it with microorganisms that grow on petri dishes in the laboratory. And that's a terrible petri dish, isn't it? Let me try that again. Replica plating. Okay, let's see. I kind of want to, I don't know why I keep drawing the edges pointy. Okay, there we go. That's a better petri dish, I think. So here's a petri dish, and let me put some colonies, bacterial colonies on this petri dish. Let's say this petri dish has minimal medium. And we're using E. coli, and E. coli, the strain we're using is prototrophic. There's no mutations in there that make it oxotrophic. Now, what the Letterbergs came up with, what they used, is replica plating, and what it involves is taking a velvet cloth. And I'm not sure why it needs to be velvet, but I think I think colonies or bacteria tend to stick better to velvet. So a sterile velvet cloth, and then you can wrap it along the base of a cylinder, and you can use like an elastic band to keep that cloth in place on the cylinder. So this is a velvet and what you can do is stamp this, well pick up the colonies just by lightly touching this to the surface of the media. The cells will stick, some of the cells in each colony will stick to the velvet cloth and then you can use that velvet cloth to transfer all of the colonies by stamping it, stamping the sterile cloth down onto a new plate of medium and as a result you're transferring little bits of cells from this plate to the exact same spots positions on the other plate so you can make a replica plate so every one of these colonies can be transferred to the exact same spot on the other plate you can do this many times. So you could take this colony right here. All these colonies will be growing in the same spots on every plate you stamp. So they're going to use this method right here to test the mutations are directed or mutations are random hypotheses. So essentially what the Letterbergs did was they took... E. coli that was susceptible to, let's say, T1 bacteriophage. I think it was T1. And they grew thousands of colonies on a petri dish without exposing. the cell culture to the bacteriophage. And then they used their replicate plating method and they were able to stamp all of these colonies onto medium, let's say three plates. Let's say they did three plates. I don't know how many they did. At some point, future versions of the course, I think we'll actually look at their original paper. But here I'll just for now describe the results. So let's say three different plates of medium. The first one without T1, so no T1. This one is with T1 bacteriophage. With T1, with T1, with T1. These three all have, let's say, the bacteriophage embedded in the medium. Now when they replica plate these, what they saw was colonies that were resistant 
to the T1 bacteriophage and they were at the same spot on each plate. Now, what does that tell us? So this strain had not seen bacteriophage T1 in the past. The only time it saw T1 was when the cells were transferred to these plates over here. So the fact that we see colonies that are resistant to T1 bacteriophage at the same location on each of these plates says the mutations must have occurred over here. Say this one right here and this one right here and this one right here. The mutations must have occurred before bacteria bacterium was introduced or had come into contact with the virus. So what's happening and what this experiment suggests is that mutations are occurring at random as E. coli is just growing, living its life, doing whatever it's supposed to do. They're occurring randomly. It's only after exposure to the agent that, that we're able to see where those mutations occurred. It's not the uh, exposure to the agent that is causing the mutation. It's the environment that is selecting for uh, survival of bacteria that happen to have a mutation that benefits survival. So their experiment, the Letterberg's experiment supports mutations are random. Now with biology, right, there's always exceptions, and we do know of cases where mutations are induced. So here's a nice one. If you take BSC 350, we will, talk, we will talk about this a lot, and maybe we talk about it in immunology here at ISU, but there's a mechanism in humans and other mammals, uh, hypermutation, so somatic hypermutation. So that's a mechanism that specifically mutates genes in our immune system to, to help our immune system to detect a, a lots of different, uh, I guess, pathogens and antigens and things like that. So sometimes they can be directed, but for the most part, in general, mutations are random. And that's what Letterberg's first, the Letterberg's experiment supported. Okay, so that's it for the directed versus random hypothesis with respect to mutations. And uh, I will see you in the next video where we talk about induced and spontaneous mutations.